astronomers are historians, meticulously piecing together 14 billion years of cosmic time. A huge part of our universe is galaxies, and so they hold the key to understanding our history. But some of the biggest techniques that astronomers use to learn about galaxies, we've discovered here in Perth, Western Australia, have been plagued by an assumption that means we don't know galaxies as well as we might have thought. If you look up at the night sky, you see a galaxy. You see our galaxy, the Milky Way. And what you see with the naked eye are some of the hundred billion stars that make up our Milky Way. But if you look at a dark patch of the night sky, you can't see it with your naked eyes. But beyond our Milky Way are billions of other galaxies. And they don't all look like our own. Our galaxy is a spiral galaxy. It's a disk, shaped a bit like a frisbee. It has those gorgeous spiral arms, and it's quite blue in color. But other galaxies are tiny in comparison. Dwarf galaxies, some of which are forming stars as quickly as they can, perhaps trying to catch up with their own Milky Way. But they're never going to get there. At the other end of the scale, we have elliptical galaxies, some of the largest galaxies in our universe. They loom over even our own Milky Way. They've lost all their structure, and they're very red in color. Some galaxies live on their own. Our galaxy is like that. We don't really have many big neighbors. But others live in small groups. They tear and tug at each other, annoy each other, interact with each other. They leave huge scars on each other's structure. And then you have the largest structures in the universe galaxy clusters. They're made up of hundreds to thousands of galaxies. These are so massive, they distort space and time itself. In this cluster, you might already recognize some features. Some spiral galaxies, like our Milky Way. Suddenly, they look a lot smaller. If you really squint, you might spot a few dwarf galaxies. They're just twinkles in the sky on this scale. But what you'll see most of all are these huge elliptical galaxies. They take up most of the structure. You'll also note that all of those objects have different colors. We want to understand how all of these galaxies came to be and how they came to be so different. One thing we know has an impact on how these galaxies look is when their stars formed. A galaxy that formed all of its stars billions of years ago, shortly after the Big Bang, a time that was very chaotic, will look very different. It will look very red and very massive to a galaxy that formed its stars more recently, a time when the universe was much calmer. That galaxy might look bluer, probably much smaller. To understand and follow this more clearly, we want to measure the star formation histories for galaxies. When did they form their stars? And more importantly, when did they stop forming those stars? For that, we turn to their color. To look at a color of a galaxy, we first turn to the stars that make up that galaxy. Young stars burn bright and hot, so they're quite blue in color. But as those stars age, they get dimmer and cooler, and they start to look quite red. So with an assumption that color links to age, we can see a blue star and know that it's quite young, whereas that red star is quite old. But there's something that gets in the way of that simple assumption. Much like a sunset on a dusty day, if you look at a really hot blue star through a thin veil of dust, it starts to look quite red. Add more dust, it gets even redder. So our simple assumption is now broken because a blue star can look red just because of that dust. So we make an update to our assumption. If you know how much dust is in front of that star, then you can use its color to figure out how old it is. But there's one more culprit that gets in the way of us understanding the age of that star. Everything that you see was produced by a star. As stars are born and formed and eventually die, they convert hydrogen gas into all the other elements that you see around us. When that star dies, it flings all of the metals, as astronomers call them, out into space. 
We're all the lucky outcome of an instance where all of those metals coalesced back to each other to form structure and eventually life. But usually, those metals are flung back out into the gas of a galaxy, ready to form a new generation of stars. Those stars will then be slightly more what we call metal-rich than the generation that came before. The metal content of these stars is only very small, but it's enough to have an impact on the light of that star. Much like an older star is red, or dust causes it to look redder, the metal content of a star also makes it redder. Now, a galaxy is more than just a couple of stars. It's made up of hundreds of billions of stars. So looking at the color of a galaxy is a little bit more complex. You can see galaxies in a small snippet of the electromagnetic spectrum called visible light. If you look at the distribution of wavelengths or brightness of wavelengths within that visible light, you get a small hint at the true color of that galaxy. But astronomers can use telescopes to look beyond visible light. When you map the brightness of a galaxy in different wavelengths of light, you measure what we call a spectral energy distribution. The shape of that spectral energy distribution tells us a lot about that galaxy. We know how much dust we need to account for, how many stars are in that galaxy, how old those stars are. But to get all of that information just from a spectral energy distribution requires a little bit of work. It's a little bit like coming up with the recipe to your favorite cake. You know what that cake looks like. You certainly know what it tastes like. But you don't know what ingredients are in there, how many of each, or even the ratios to put in. So, with a little bit of experimentation, a good sense of taste, and a lot of taste testing, if you come across the right combination of ingredients, that results in a cake that tastes and looks just like the one that you love, then you found the right recipe. You can do the same thing for galaxies. We call it modeling. If you produce a model of a galaxy with various stars, various amounts of dust, stars of different ages, and just the right metal content, and you produce the light that matches that, what we observe with our telescopes, then you've measured the properties of that galaxy. This sort of modeling is one of our favorite tools in our toolbox of astronomy to learn about those galaxies. So you can imagine our concern when we realize that the star formation histories we measure aren't quite right. There's some ingredient that's missing. Some assumption we've made doesn't work. The last couple of years, I've done a lot of cosmic baking. We've looked at the assumptions. What have we done? And we found that wrong assumption. And that assumption was that metals don't stay the same in galaxies. That metal content builds up over time. The first stars to form in a galaxy have only hydrogen gas. But by the time the last stars have formed, they're formed out of a pool of gas that contains the metals produced by the generations of stars that came before. It's a small detail, but that detail in our modeling was enough such that our star formation histories suddenly make sense. Over the past couple of years, up to a decade, astronomers here in Perth at the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research have been collecting data for what is known as galaxy redshift surveys, where in a patch of the sky, we map every galaxy in three-dimensional space by measuring their distance. We now have maps of the universe with all the locations for these galaxies, and we also have a spectral energy distribution for each and every one of them. And using all of those data, we can now look at the forensic histories for each of these galaxies. That lets us answer some very specific questions about these galaxies that we share our universe with. For a galaxy that's all on its own, what causes it to stop forming stars? If a galaxy is suddenly surrounded by others, does that stop it forming stars faster? If a galaxy has been dead for billions of years, can it start forming stars a second time around? 
Galaxies form the backbone of our universe. So many of the big questions that remain to be answered in astronomy will rely on an accurate understanding of these galaxies to get to the right answers. Why are there fewer stars forming now than billions of years ago? Where is all the mass in the universe? What is dark matter? Science rarely takes huge leaps. We build up a bridge to our understanding, brick by brick, building layers and layers of facts, data, and assumption to connect our knowledge and build that bigger picture. We have to constantly check that those bricks are solid and sound. When we update our scientific assumptions, we find the rip brick, we replace it, sometimes we have to demolish a chunk and rebuild it. This is the principle that makes science strong, how we build that strong bridge. What will be the assumption in my work that needs to be fixed in the future? Which brick might still need replacing? I don't know. Perhaps in the future I will find it, or another scientist. Perhaps that could be you. Thank you. <laughs>